What's going on, everybody? I was playing multiplayer with a friend of mine, and she mentioned that the Sullivan's Blade, at least the uh, the start of the quest, the option to to go find it, is in the Empire du Leon, and uh, that it's in an area where I had actually been before and just like totally missed it, some abandoned camp or something. Anyway, so I thought I would go back there and look, and uh, while we were there, maybe take Iron Bull on a uh, on a fun run against a dragon. As much as he loves that, he's been denied for too long his uh, his dragon slaying rights, <laughs> right? He's also uh, nothing beats his dialogue when you first face a dragon. He's like, "Boss, you're the best, man." He, he likes it way too much, actually. But uh, here's this campsite. This is this is where I found it. Like I said, I've been over here, but uh, totally overlooked it somehow. And that's where the dragons would be. We'll cross that bridge here in a minute. So let me go ahead and pick this up, and this, I think, activates it at the war table. And you, you go to the war table, and essentially unlock a new area, kind of like the uh, the ruins where you go investigate the elven glyphs that you find all over the place in the Exalted Plains, that type of thing. All right, but having crossed the bridge, go, go up against this first dragon here. Try to kill as many of these guys in the game as I can. It's also a, a decent test run to kind of see what kind of damage we can put out. I have an Iron Bowl with me. It's about the same as having Cassandra. Um, the only downside is Cassandra throws up Blessed Blades a lot, and that essentially gives you a constant damage buff within that. And you can stack that with Ring of Pain. It's cool. Um, I don't know if Ring of Pain stacks with Iron Bowl. Um, I have him using it. He does activate it. In fact, I think he's got it on right now. But, uh, didn't really, um, didn't consciously test it here, I guess you could say. But uh, I have to assume that it's possible. If nothing else, you know, lets him get his damage bonus. I know if you have Ring of Pain active and um, in multiplayer now, then I'm speaking for multiplayer. If you have it active in any mage or any other ally standing in your Ring of Pain, it does more damage. And we, I actually did test that with uh, a mage friend of mine. Um, I was like, go ahead and throw a few shots out there, see what you get, and then I'll, I'll drop Ring of Pain and stand inside of it, and then shoot him a couple more times and see what you get. And it was it was an it was an increase. I don't know exactly what the percentage was, but it was it was higher overall damage. That was cool. So it's essentially the same effect as Blessed Blades, I guess. Although Blessed Blades would almost be preferable in that it just lasts on its own. It doesn't drain your stamina or anything else. It's a one-time shot, and then it's just there. As long as the enemy's taunted. Now, if you if you watched my uh, my Dragon Reaver build, because after this character, I started a new one. Um, well, actually, I started an assassin, did a did a build on that, and I was really happy with the way that turned out, considering I hadn't even completely maximized the gear and it was putting up uh, really sexy numbers. Um, so I started another one of these, because what I wanted to do was find an ornate battle axe schematic, at least at some point during my playthrough. It was about actually the only item I, I really wanted to find, because um, it's it's a random drop. It's not something you can buy anywhere. You need to actually discover it. I already knew where to get the armor that I wanted. I already had all that in mind, and I uh, found that, no problem, at the uh, at the Hissing Wastes. It was a rogue set, and used some snow floor skin and crank up the cunning really, really high, and my critical chance was through the roof, so um, critical damage-wise, I don't know um, how much necessarily of a difference it would have made. Um, with the Ornate Battle Axe, it would have been awesome because essentially what it allows you to do is put um, leather into your offense slots as opposed to metal, and what that essentially allows you to do is raise um, critical chance and critical damage instead of, like, I don't know, extra barrier damage or guard damage or, you know, strength like you would with um, with metal slots. Yeah, so you could raise your uh, dexterity, cunning, critical chance, critical damage, 
that type of thing. And um, anyway, so I, I didn't find one, but uh, I actually made do with a tier two item, which is the jagged battle axe, which is basically the ornate battle axe's little brother. It's uh, it's only it only has two upgrade um, slots instead of three. And it doesn't require quite as much material, which means that like each piece of material gives you a certain amount of that bonus. Like, let's say, just for example, a piece of material gives you an extra point of, I don't know, strength, right? Okay, so if you put in five pieces, you get plus five strength. Well, if a schematic calls for like six, eight, or ten pieces, then you're going to get that much more. And so the Ornate Battle Axe not only has a whole extra slot, but each slot calls for a little bit more material. And, you know, if you use top-tier materials, you can get your, like... My whole idea was getting my critical chance up some more and then just getting my critical damage over the top because not only do you have three tiers to put um, rogue rogue type materials in, like leather and even cloth, um, I believe it's dragon webbing counts as a cloth and that actually raises your uh, is it critical damage or critical chance. It's one of the two, but it counts the tier four items. So you can, I mean, just totally gear that one weapon towards specifically what you want to do. And then if you put a, a grip and a pommel on it that also raised your critical damage even more. Um, let's put it this way, it had a tier 2 battle axe that had a plus 80% critical damage. And it could have been even higher than that, plus had maybe some extra critical chance thrown in also. And the whole idea was to maybe not maybe not put up the biggest criticals, but put a lot put up a lot more of them. Where, you know, it's better than a coin toss. You've got 50% plus chance of, of dropping a critical every time you do a basic attack. And essentially, um, it allows for um, relying on mostly just basic attacks. You don't have to use a whole bunch of weapon skills and stuff like that. Uh, Mighty Blow, Block and Slash, um, things like that. I mean, they're, they're things I use anyway. And you got to figure if, like, I'll just throw you an example in there. And this is this is kind of like a, uh, what would you say, a combo, all right? Is imagine taunting a target, right, and then getting a double buff, a double 20% buff uh, against taunted targets, damage buff for the whole party, not just you. Okay, that's awesome. Freezing us after death. Awesome dragon there. Awesome. Uh, I'm calling cheap on that one. But, um... Alright, so if you can imagine double buffing them like that, and then throwing Ring of Pain down, right? And already maybe having some health missing, so you've already got a little bonus damage from that, or whatever. Alright, but then, um... Throwing in all that extra uh, critical damage... And then once that enemy gets below a certain threshold, like you notice, the d the numbers start to go up as the enemies as the enemies you know dies, right? Once they get down to about that thirty percent mark, you start to really put up some some even nicer numbers. And then as your health goes down, even better, right? And so everything kind of feeds off itself. And imagine putting up some really really um, sexy criticals. Maybe even incorporating a lot of uh, sunder armor, where you where you crack enemies' armor and essentially bypass it for a, sh a period of time. Um, maybe Sunder sunder on, you know, critical, and then um, Sunder on hit for all of your mages. Put it on their staves, you know, or something like that, if, you know, if it applies. Whatever you can do to break down their armor or bypass it all together and then put up some really uh, sexy critical numbers to where you're you're almost like a rogue. I mean, you're like a Reaver rogue in a sense, you know, type of thing. But instead of going after single targets, you just go in there with your big two-handed weapon and just, you know, swing in big arcs. Hold, Keep your eyes closed and swing as hard as you can and hope you hit something type of thing. And, uh, yeah, that was the idea. I didn't get the weapon, but uh, still managed to put up decent numbers with a Tier 2 Battle Axe, actually. In fact, uh, with, with Dragon Rage and with that axe equipped, which, like I say, it could have been better, I was putting up numbers about the equivalent of what I'm putting up here with this character, and I, I'd even thought of maybe... Uh, doing a build and, I don't know, maybe one day on down the road. I'm not going to say I'm burned on this, but... I played through a warrior full game twice, and, you know, and looking for that stupid schematic, I essentially went everywhere and opened every chest I could think of, trying to find it. Never got, never got lucky, but um, you know, maybe start a warrior someday. And you know, by then, I don't know that it'll be old news. I don't know what the shelf life on this game is going to be, as opposed to um, Origins and maybe Dragon Age Two, which even with its bad rep, it's still being played. So I can assume this will still have some life in it for a while. So maybe. Maybe do a build on that and do a, you know, just a strictly a DPS Reaver. And it'll be an offshoot of this. Um, it really might not be necessary. If you've kept up with this, essentially take this build and switch out the equipment for anything that gives you critical chance and critical damage, right? Um, the higher critical chance you got, obviously, the more criticals you're going you're gonna to hit with, right? And the higher critical damage, obviously, the more damage you'll do. And then keep in mind that in the damage calculator, 
um, armor comes after critical damage bonus, right? And that you start with a 40% critical damage bonus right off the top. That's default for all characters. And so if you can add another um, 60 to 160% critical damage um, between your gear, um, and then keep in mind getting your critical chance up there at least to around the 50% mark. Um, I didn't quite do that with my uh, with my Dragon Reaver. Although when you factor in, you know, passives and buffs and stuff, it was right at about 50%. I'd have liked to have been a little higher. Um, I don't know if they nerfed cunning or if it's always been like this, but you get half a point of critical chance per point of cunning. And so um, I had my, oh, I had my Reaver right up at like 41% before any other passives. Like, that's not counting having Varric in your party or um, when enemies around you get to a certain health, it adds like 10% to your critical chance, you know, and, and stuff like that. 25% um, to your critical chance after you use Devour. Once Devour is upgraded, um, your next use of Dragon Rage has a plus 25% chance, which basically puts it up there in a guaranteed. But it seemed like well over half the time I was still putting up criticals anyway. Um, of course, the higher that is, I, I would like it to where I'm essentially putting up criticals all the time. Or at least uh, so often that, um, you know, just about every time you swing, you see, you know, at least some kind of critical number get up there. And that's, you know, that's cool with me. Um, I think, in, you know, after really looking at it and seeing, okay, what's the benefit? I'll, I'll, I'll give you some downsides. Might as well fill some empty time here. Essentially what I'm doing is uh, running around. I found out there was a lot of loot in here. I'm glad I brought uh, a rogue along too because there are some locked doors here um, that have some collectibles and other stuff like that behind them. More loot boxes. Lots of loot boxes here. But um, while I'm just running around, uh, eventually we're going to have to use this veil fire to uh, activate these altars and find the sword pieces. Of course, there's a boss guarding each one, right? I mean, we already figured that. But uh, I think it's I think it's like four four pieces altogether, at least three, something like that. All right, but um, the downside to the Dragon Rage, what I saw is stamina management, which seems to be the biggest problem with most people. Um, the advantage of basic attacks is your basic attacks can restore your stamina pool greatly. I would say a quarter of an empty stamina pool can be restored by one simple hit with your with your primary weapon. So essentially, if you can mix Dragon Rage and kind of get a flow, um, you know, kind of a feel a feel for the battle, like how many swings you can get away with before you've got enough stamina to use Devour, right? And then hit, you know, swing a few Dragon Rage, a few basic weapon swings to where you can use Devour again. And I did set up to my, my build to where Devour was basically instantly on cooldown at all times. There's some passives and other things in the trees that you can put together where... Basically, one or two hits from Dragon Rage or two or three swings from your primary weapon as long as your critical chance is high essentially restores a Devour instantly. So it's always available, but you need the stamina to use it, all right? And um, I found that that could probably play better into a, a non-Dragon Rage, more of a Berserker build, similar to what I'm playing here, to what I did this build on. As a matter of fact, I think the next video I'm going to do, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm at that level where I need to go ahead and uh, cover the build here, because I like to do, you know, videos on particular builds once I've got something that I feel is, is workable and that you guys could, uh, you know, maybe get some ideas from or might be of use to somebody, okay? Um, I, I would almost prefer this style build over the Dragon Rage because Dragon Rage has a few downsides. One is if you mix it with Rampage, they nerfed it, all right? So you still get lifesteal as long as you're using Dragon Rage, okay? So it basically evens out, but here's the problem. One of the benefits of being a Reaver is that the more health you lose, the more damage you do. Well, if you get Lifesteal with using your Focus ability and use Dragon Rage at the same time, the small damage bonus you get from uh, Rampage is negated by the fact that you lose no health. All right, Because you basically get as much, if not more, health back per swing with Dragon Rage um, to, to where essentially your health pool stays full. So you get no, you get no health loss bonus. In that, so you can't stack that with Rampage. So it almost kind of cancels it out, I guess you could say. You know, normally when you use Dragon Rage, you can actually lose health as you go, and, and you know your numbers start to creep up. Okay. Well, with Rampage, you get all your health back, and sure enough, you can go in there. And and the other thing they nerfed was the speed bonus. You get no more speed bonus with Dragon Rage. You do with your with your normal attacks, with your basic attacks, you get speed bonus, but you don't get any health return. Okay. Well, that, that can be easily rectified by simply getting in there. I don't mind losing some health anyway, and if it becomes a problem, say, against big mobs, or if you've got a lot of archers around and stuff, well, you know, drop a regen potion, and you still have your potions available, right? But I don't tend to micromanage my health as much, because on Nightmare, you're going to lose health anyway, especially if you if you lean towards the type of armor 
that I found to be really effective is uh, hook up a rogue set of gear, which can raise your cunning by, you know, as much as, what, like 40 points in and of itself and get your critical chance really high. Or you could lean towards um, dexterity and get your critical damage up by 40 points, but that's not much. You can get your critical damage up 40 points with simply one upgrade on a weapon, all right? So, mm, wouldn't lean that way. I would go for cunning and put up more criticals. I'd rather hit you for 500 five or six times than 1,000 twice. That's my reasoning and logic behind that. But um, anyway, if you're going to lean towards a lighter armor, um, it's a little less protection. You're going to take some damage, you know? Like I say, you can uh, you can kind of neutralize it. If your mages are doing their job, they're going to keep barrier and guard up on you anyway. Cassandra's going to throw a whole fresh set of guard on you every once in a while just out of the blue. All right, and so survivability really isn't isn't um, a problem, you know, my opinion. Um, so Dragon Rage really has more downside than upside from what I've seen. Um, it's it's a fun play style if you want to sit there and, and manage your health and your stamina, essentially keeping your, your eye on both gauges. And like I say, finding a pattern to your fighting. Like, I know how many basic attacks will refill my stamina meter, and I know how many Dragon Rage swipes I can get away with before I've lost enough stamina because Ring of Pain drops your stamina so, so fast it's ridiculous. No doubt, Beric. Your uh, grasp of the obvious is amazing. But uh, anyway, so so if you guys can relate, that's 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 kind of the issues that I saw. And it was it was fun in its own way, but I prefer a berserker. I prefer more of a uh, build as much focus as you can, use rampage as often as possible, and just go to town with your weapon. You can get your rampage to tier two and tier three. Your attack speed goes way the hell up there. And then as enemies are start dying around you, if you're in mobs, your attack speed goes up even more because of your passive. Well, it's your movement speed, but it, you know I don't know that your actual attack speed, but you can move around quicker, and you just feel like you're you're energize and you're going on a rampage and you're just going to town i dig that that's what i liked a lot about uh dragon age 2 was the uh the speed of the combat and the brutality of it it's it's slowed down become a little more visceral a little more you know witcher dark souls like in this which isn't a bad thing but um i still i still really like that uh that heavy the haste the the super speed of dragon age 2 combat which i'm in now and i'm enjoying it immensely um, at easily as much as this or Origins. It's, uh, right up there on my list with the rest of them. Okay, and I guess I need to physically get Vivian to drop that torch. She's going to hang on to that Veil Fire for the life of her. Like how you can actually dodge that Spirit Grab move? You can actually evade that? That's pretty cool. Yeah, apparently your mages don't know to drop the Veil Fire once the action starts. I think the deal here is that each revenant gets increasingly more difficult as you gather pieces. I think that's how this goes. I say that because I came in here with my other warrior, just thinking it'd be you know, somewhat of a breeze. The elves broke it after all. That and I was, uh, was possessed by a pride demon, no doubt drawn by the elves' use of blood magic. There must I was level to... 17, and. Uh, one of the revenants, I couldn't get past him. I just, I couldn't beat him. And, uh, you know, I was, I was streaming at the time, too. And I was starting to just get really annoyed. I was like, well, this is just bad, bad design here. You know, don't, don't, you know, this artificial difficulty crap. I was throwing all kinds of accusations at him. And then I bothered to actually look at the revenant. He was, uh, what, 20 or 21? And I'm 17. And he's got this horde of uh, level 20 corpses around him that he's raising up, too. And I couldn't get past the mob, much less deal with the revenant, who was one-hitting everybody. I was like, what the hell? And then I realized that it was me, not the game. Of course, my fault. You know, always blame it on the computer, right? What's up? Hey, did you hear that comment um, while I was blabbing my lips a second ago? Vivian said that that, that Revenant was possessed by a spirit of pride. And if that's the case, is, 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 that, is that true with, like, all Revenants? From what I understand, Revenants are basically um, Tevinter Templars that basically are sworn to protect their mage masters even after death type of thing. So if you come messing with their stuff, and if that's the case, well, the, if these aren't Taventers, if this is Elven ruins, then I think ancient Elves, ancient Taventers, and are, aren't either so aren't as removed or separate as we once once might have thought, or something's going on. But I say that that whole history that is essentially prehistory, pre-recorded history, um, where things were a bit different, aren't as we see them now, aren't as what we read in the lore and stuff. Um, it, it wasn't like they say it was back then. I think the Chantries misled. I think the Elves 
that you talk to now that you know in their in their traditions are passing down the lore of their forefathers they don't know what the hell was going on even sarah essentially alludes to that and she says it's it's not history it's just fancy dress you know they're, they're play acting they're they're playing these roles of what they, they thought the ancestors might have been through legends and and uh um, traditions and stuff passed down that really have no basis in truth they're just uh a lot of them are superstition a lot of them are uh um, grudges passed along, you know? Any, anyone can say something about history with a bias, right? American history has a lot of that. A lot of bias, a lot of political agenda involved in there rather than any kind of truth whatsoever. Everything's got a, got a, a spin or a twist or an angle, you know? Nothing is just, you know, person A did this to person B and then person C did this and, you know, th there's really not a lot of that. The way they present it is always with a, a certain political flair on, um, they throw in bias, who you should side with and how you should see things and hating things that shouldn't be hated and, and liking things that should be despised. I don't like seeing them explode and destroy cities. Faith's not really a big factor there. So I see that in play here in Dragon Age lore in history. Is that nothing's really as it, as it, as it seems, I don't think. There's a lot of things to be discovered. And that's good, because that leaves openings for more game, more story, more, more revelations, more exploring, more what have you. Right, and we see also, I'd like to point this out, we're on the, uh, Flemeth says this, we're on the precipice of change, okay? And I, I'm playing Dragon Age 2 as we speak, so this is, is bringing some clarity to some stuff. And what seem to be passing comments have a whole lot more relevance when you see them in hindsight. As things get revealed in Inquisition, you go back and listen to some things that people say, and it's huge. I mean, there's a direct reference to Flemeth being Mythal. I mean, essentially, oh, you're working for Flemeth, huh? Well, Mythal guides you. Stuff like that isn't said by accident, you know. But um, I'm looking back and, I, and I'm seeing things that are said. I'm saying, oh, wow, that's that's bringing a whole lot of relevance, a lot of things to light here. Okay, well, this isn't good. This totally threw me off. What, why, why would that one light up all of these? I guess this is the main dude. This is going to be my last piece here. This is letting me know it's going down. Uh, one thing that came up um, while I was playing was... Uh, oh, 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 just to get back to my point. I, I actually totally forgot for a second. Um, Flemeth makes a, a, a comment that you're on the precipice of change, right? When you take that, that... When you get that opportunity to plunge into the abyss, don't hesitate. Was that a reference to Dragon Age 2? Was that a reference... Re uh, uh, um, or was that something in Inquisition where Hawk actually uh, takes that plunge with you? into the abyss, right? I mean, is is that was that the reference? Okay, because that actually essentially does happen on the precipice of change, and we see all of the institutions, institutions of men are crumbling, are collapsing. None of them are what they used to be. The Seekers aren't the Seekers. The Templars are not the Templars, okay? Except by name. The Circle was no longer the Circle for a while, right? We saw all that, and so um, everything as it was designed to be had been corrupted by man to the point that it was unrecognizable, except in name only, right? And so things need to change, and so Inquisition, we see this turning point. Well, the previous Inquisition was at a great time of peril and change, and I think looking to the history before that is where a lot of answers lie for the present and the future here in Dragon Age, if that makes sense. Like, a lot of what was lost um, through, like I say, the political agendas and the, uh, and the bias of people recording that history at the time, as opposed to what, what went on before, you know, where, like I say, I think human and elven tradition are both completely off off track. Chantry stuff has been uh, totally corrupted by the um, desires and um, schemes of, of men, you know, wicked, corrupt, awful, criminal type people in the ranks um, using religious doctrine for their own profit. Oh, whoever heard of any of that? You can't just like look down the street and see that shit today, right? Okay, so no nothing new there. But uh, you know, just, you know, just just looking and saying, you know, you take real life principles and you apply them here and you say, you know, there's probably a lot to be seen uh, prior to the first Inquisition as we're seeing what's happening here. History repeats itself. So if you wonder what things were like before and what things are like after, use this as an example. What were things like leading into Dragon Age 2, the events thereof, which lead to Dragon Age Inquisition, the crumbling of everything, and what's going to rise up from the ashes? 
some new beginning, right? And the history from origins all the way through to Inquisition is going to be muddied up if people aren't careful by people with their own views. Let a Templar write it, and guess who's going to be at fault? Who's going to be the cause of everything? Let a mage write it, and vice versa. Whose fault is it? For you For you that play this game, for you that side with mages, don't you just hate Templars just on sight? Regardless, you know, except for maybe Colin because you like his hair, or whatever, or you lust after him. But besides that, um, bottom line is depend on who you listen to is who was at fault and what really went down and how it went down. And that can be muddied up. All it takes is for one person to whisper it in the next guy's ear, and it's already half untrue. Right, because it's based on opinion and bias and agenda and political spin and, and what have you. Right, um, not on fact, not on you know. I don't like this, but this is the way it went down. You don't get people. You can't trust anybody, other than in fact, you can't even trust yourself half the time to really be that just straight up about things. A lot of times, because you'll want to um, throw um, a little of your own preference on things. You know, as to, as how exactly did that go down? Let me throw in a white lie here to kind of clean that up. And then let me make like this guy, you know, who really wasn't at fault. Let me make him a little more at fault so I look less at fault type of thing. Well, that's all it takes to totally just corrupt and pervert history, right? And you get enough people writing it down and get involved. And what you have left is, um, you know, if the next guy on down the line who wasn't there, you know, a few generations down the road who didn't see it happen, he relies on you to tell him how it went down. He's going to get this perverted view of it, right? Uh, that's just the way it is. And so, anyway, just something to keep in mind. I think that's that's yet again the uh, that that men are flawed, people are flawed, and so um, in their um, reckoning of how things are and how things work, um, I think you're going to find a lot of uh, errors and misconceptions and stuff like that. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. But we can take these events right here as an example of what may have happened around the time of the first Inquisition. And then look at the at the playtime that we have had through Origins, Dragon Age 2, and Inquisition. And look at how things went down and how, you know, the, the camps were so far divided. How there's this great gap, this great gulf between the Circle and the Chantry and the Templars. And, you know, this huge division and then any other, you know, the Wardens and so on and so forth. And look what became of everything. And it, like I say, if you ask three different people how that went down from three different camps, you'll get three completely different stories. Who was at fault? Who did what? How they did it? We know this guy did it, but it makes us look bad, so we won't mention that. You know, it just takes a little of that. And uh, anyway, so I, I think that's what we have. I think that's why the lore, the the lore with like the elves, the elves don't know what the hell is going on, what the hell it was like. They probably don't know any more about the ancients than we do. For example, Flemeth is showing a lot of that. Uh, not to mention, uh, you know, some things surrounding Solus and. Even heard some stuff uh, regarding Sarah, which I, I don't really buy into that. Um, I don't see her as being an ancient being reborn and, you know, the Sarah that we know now type thing. But uh, there's definitely something going on um, with Sarah and Flemeth. I mean, uh, with Solus and Flemeth. All right, so uh, all that's left for us to do, I did take one quick uh, thorough look around after that to see if I missed anything. I couldn't find anything, except for, I think, uh, a plant or something. But uh, let's get back and give these to Dagna and see what she can do with them. Calm your britches. Calm your britches, Dagna. We found a sword in an elven ruin. Can you do something with it? That broken thing? You can't stitch a sword. Metal doesn't heal. What if it did, though? That would be amazing. Dagna, the sword. Um, Dagna? Earth to Dagna? It's quality, right? I could use the pieces to make a plan for a new sword. One that's less broken. It's like the pieces are inspiration. That's just perfect for you. All right, and there we have it, Sullivan's Blade. And it's ours. It has a decent DPS. It's um, basically the same thing we had in multiplayer. Excited? Spring gets me excited. This is a wonder. It's probably hard to relate, but dwarves don't dream, so I can't even guess what it's like. 
I can't even understand what dreams are. But you were there and came back. Can I take a sample? A sample? Um, Dagna. Oh, that sounded sinister. I meant, can I cut a little piece off of you and do things to it? That sounds better, <laughs> did it? Not much, no. <laughs> Didn't sound much better. You'll have a full report of everything I saw. Will that do? It's a start. I'm sorry, it's just... This is exciting. It all is. Your people cleaned you up after your fall. I wonder if anything is left. So much to think about. The thought that Dagna is looking for pieces of my Inquisitor left behind to study is just a bit disturbing. Alright, and from here I think we'll go ahead and do a build video. I'll go ahead and cover everything where we're at today. Um, with my party and my character and skills and equipment as we have it and what have you. All right, get into that on the next one. Thanks for watching. If you want to subscribe, click that button over my head. Until the next one, y'all take care. Bye-bye.